Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The following program is brought to you by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a philanthropy serving society through biomedical research and science education. It's just a great pleasure for me to introduce um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. You can read in your materials the many, many honors he has. He has a, a, a BA in physics and a PhD in astrophysics. We won't hold that against him here. Um, and he has many activities, many titles. He's director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And of course, I'm sure everyone, when they introduce you, makes note of the last thing here that you were voted the uh, sexiest astrophysicist by... Um, <laughs> Some magazine or other, so. <laughs> now you know why we really invited. Wait, wait, wait! You got to uh -oh, no, consider the category. Oh. So, <laughs> so that's, you know, that's. And he will be grilled by our president, Tom Check, okay. whom, as you are, whom you've already met, who has a, a, a BA and a PhD in chemistry. We won't hold that against him either, and uh, has a distinguished career as a scientist, but also as a leader here of HHMI. So with no further ado, I will get out of the way. Neil, it's just terrific to have you back here at the Howard well, Hughes Medical thank you. Institute. Thank you. Thank you. So one thing that's been, that I've been wondering about is mm -hmm. you have a, a distinguished and very exciting research career, mm -hmm. but then you also are such a master at explaining scientific concepts to students and to the general public through your books and through the, the Nova Science Now series. How do you, do you feel torn between these two halves of your life? Yeah, I, I might have felt torn if it weren't for some of the, the sort of the popularizing legacy that already existed in my field. When you consider the likes of Carl Sagan and billions and billions, <laughs> billions, and billions. That's our favorite, the favorite word of the astrophysicist, <laughs> billions. <laughs> it sounds cool when you all say it together. Say it with me on three, ready? One, two, three, billions. See, that's not just a beautiful, <laughs> that's just a beautiful number. <laughs> and so he came up and decided that here we are doing astrophysics through tax-based sources, funding through NASA, the NSF, and the like. And yet the public was not a participant, even vicarious participant, on that frontier. And he felt that it was his duty as a research scientist to bring that frontier to the public, which he did, and he did better than anybody. And he, he caught a lot of flack for that at the time. His colleagues were saying, what are you doing? He, he appeared on the, on the Tonight Show, then it had Johnny Carson. And that was considered an abomination of behavior for a scientist at the time. And so he took a lot of flack for it, but stayed strong in that effort. And throughout that trajectory, what the astrophysics community noted was that the public started, uh, started feeling good about the research we were doing. And funding levels were rising. And Congress was talking about it and cosmic discoveries were making headlines when they hadn't before. And so there was a phase shift in how scientists who became popularizers were treated by their colleagues. And I am in the zone of benefit of that phase shift. There's blood on the tracks, but it was left way before me. What I have noticed, however, and that in other scientific disciplines, even one very close to mine, which is physics, that relationship does not yet exist. It is, it is considered a, a, a step away from your professional obligations if you decide to write a book or appear on television, and it does not contribute to tenure. And, you know, I don't even expect it to contribute to tenure decisions, because tenure is a research, in, in a research institution, it's a research designation, typically. I don't have a, I don't have a problem with that. What I, all I really ask for is that when I do it, don't hold it against me. Mm -hmm. at, at, at worst, just let it be neutral, and I'll, I'm, I'll be fine with that. 
So I'm saying at worst in my field it is neutral, and at best people like it and they recognize its value. I don't yet see that in other fields. I just don't. Now, now, given the draw of this sort of rock star status as Mr. Okay. Astrophysicist for the, for the nation and on uh -huh. television, do you th find yourself, though, being drawn more and more into the public expression and explanation of science and away from the research? And maybe that's not a bad thing. Well, yes. I, it's a, it's a, that's a tension. But I, we, the first ask about the tension was I th thought you meant between No, no, this was a new question. Colleagues, a new question. Oh, okay. is, is, there, is there tension within? <laughs> All right, and yes, there's tension within because my first love is actually in the lab or the astrophysicist equivalent of a lab, which is at a telescope or uh, modeling the cosmos on in the middle of some hundred thousand line computer code, and that's our lab, and I want to do that. I want, in fact, I want to do that all the time. But it's unrealistic to do it all the time. So I have to ask myself, where do I put the split? And right now it's about 80-20, 80, 80 public, 20 research. Uh, I want to pull that back in about a year. I want to get that back to about 60-40, 50-50. Now, now before we go on, we better all be reminded of what an astrophysicist is because I, I think some of us, it could even include me, might be a little Which fuzzy. Which means it does, including uh, me, uh, right? About the difference between an astronomer and an astrophysicist. Okay, there's no difference. Oh, okay. okay. Well. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> no. The uh, up until eight, the 1860s or so, uh, really 1850s, but really riding high 1860s and 1870s, the application of spectroscopy to the universe became a big business, big uh, cottage industry. And what that meant was, when you're sitting behind a telescope, you could deduce more about the universe than where the star was in the sky and how bright it was. You could analyze the light with the spectroscope and determine the chemical composition of the star. You could look at the spectral features and check for Doppler shifts in those spectral features to judge, is the star moving towards you or away from you? If the, if the, if the spectral feature is broadened, that tells you that the star is spinning fast because it's one star unresolved. Some part of the star is moving towards you that gives you a little bit of a blue shift in the line. Some part is moving away from you, and there's a continuum of emissions in between. So the line actually fattens in the spectral signature. And so you can deduce the rotation rates, the speeds. The, and all of a sudden, laws of physics mm -hmm. that were previously enjoyed in the laboratory were now cast into the universe. Laws of physics beyond simple gravity. Chemistry, for example. And, uh, quantum mechanics, not yet invented, but of course, Spectral lines is all about quantum mechanics. So um, in the late 1800s, uh, departments of astronomy that were freshly conceived were then called departments of astrophysics. Mm -hmm. And the Journal of Astrophysics was born, uh, predated by a Journal of Astronomy. But today, we all do the same thing. We all have extensive training in physics and mathematics. And we all talk to each other completely fluently. So and you're, both doing a co you're all mostly doing a combination of observational work, data collection, and analysis yeah, that's right. And, computers. And very few of us do it all. Mm -hmm. There are people who are primarily go to telescopes, others who primarily are pencil and paper, and others who primarily are on a computer. And it's the synthesis of those that advances the frontier. Now, now you mentioned gravity a minute mm -hmm. ago. And I was- Obey gravity. Okay. I was, yes, so it's, it's a no law. choice on that, yeah. Yeah, I, I know, I always do. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was struck by the title of your most recent book, oh. This Death by Black Hole, and, and that's certainly a, an intense gravitational experience. Yeah, you want to avoid black holes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. What, would, what would this feel like? That'd be a bad day if you, uh, in my recent book, now in paperback, just came out in paperback. Th thanks for the plug, by the way. <laughs> I hadn't planned to plug the book, but. It just came in so naturally. You, you, you no mentioned it. No one would it. have noticed. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it's called Death by Black Hole and, uh, and Other Cosmic Quandaries. But it's from a section of the book called When the Universe Turns Bad, o All the Ways the Cosmos Wants to Kill Us. And th see, there's so much, so many people talk about oh, how beautiful the universe is, or how beautiful Earth is. It's like they're ignoring a whole part of what the universe is trying to do that would just as soon have us dead. And so there's a whole section in the book that kind of celebrates that fact. 
Um, the rest, uh, and the rest is really what it is to be a scientist. Um, yes, I'm an astrophysicist, so there's a lean towards the universe, but it's really how to be a scientist at all. And not so much how to be a scientist, but how to celebrate the enterprise of discovery, of scientific discovery. And um, it's gotten very good reviews. It actually made the New York Times bestseller, my first book to do so. H however, it, it's the, it was like minimum bestseller case, okay? It got to the lowest rung and was there for one week and then left, okay? <laughs> so, no, it turns out. Was this fiction or non -fiction? No, no, it was. <laughs> so it turns out the publisher, while they'd rather it be higher on the list, anywhere on the list they get to say New York oh, Times yeah. bestseller on the next printing. <laughs> they don't have to say it was only there for six days, six and a half days. They don't have to say that. So uh, in a black hole, yeah, you want to avoid them. If, as you fall in, if you imagine a feet first dive into a black hole, uh, what happens is black holes are small. And like right now as you stand, you're about six feet tall, your feet or closer would it, to the, would this sort of be the size of the black the, oh, there are black holes that size for sure mm -hmm. others are larger uh, if this Earth, is not one though I, I that, well, check, try we, it we can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we do is you if, if you're standing on earth your feet are closer to the center of the earth than your head is by six feet yes so you can calculate the force of gravity on your feet it's just a simple equation provided by Isaac Newton. You might remember from your physics class. And calculate the force of gravity on your head. And you get and they're two not very different. They are different, but they're not very different. Not very different. Not so different that you would notice it biologically. All right. It turns out that if the object that has gravity is small, then your height becomes a more significant fraction of the size of the object than it would be for the Earth. Here you are on Earth, and here's the diameter of the Earth. But now here you are, and now black hole's that, and you're this. So now you calculate the difference. It's huge. It's huge. As you fall towards the center of a black hole, that difference in gravity grows. Uh-oh. Now. I think I'm going to get elongated. OK, so, well, so initially it kind of feels good. You know, you kind of stretch. <laughs> Stretching feels good, right? We all want to stretch. When you wake up in the morning, you don't crunch. You stretch. Yeah. So it feels good, but then you realize that the growing force is unrelenting. And it will reach a point, you can calculate this, where the difference in gravity exceeds the molecular bonds that attach your flesh as one solid piece of body. And so there's a point where, you, where you'll snap into two pieces. and It'll likely be at the base of your spine. Now, those two pieces then begin to feel this difference in gravity between their top and their bottom, and then they snap into two pieces. So we go from one to two to four to eight to 16 to 32. And eventually you become this stream of atoms headed down towards the abyss. Now, it's actually worse than that uh, because <laughs> as you fall, we know from Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity, which is the, our understanding of gravity, that the fabric of space and time funnels down to a point. So not only are you stretched head to toe, you are extruded through the fabric of space like toothpaste through a tube. In fact, we have a word for dying in this manner. Oh, yes? Yes, it's called spaghettification. <laughs> okay. Sounds very scientific. Yeah, there you go. Well, actually, don't get me started on that. Because in astrophysics, we feel very strongly about this, and I'm going to get in your face now, OK? OK. I, I'm not going to blame you personally, but I'm going to blame you by association. OK. The universe is hard enough. The last thing the universe needs is a complex lexicon laid down between the communicator and the listener to confuse them about what it is they're trying to listen to. So in astrophysics, we tell it like it is. <laughs> We don't research Latin, Greek vocabulary words <laughs> and invent as big a word as we can to describe something simple. Yeah. Now, let me tell you, what, what do we call spots on the sun? Sunspots. Sun spots. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Ju uh. 
big red stars, they're called red giants, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Jupiter has a large red spot on its surface. We call that Jupiter's red spot, all right? So Saturn has rings. Saturn has rings. We call those rings, all right? <laughs> so whereas you take a peek at biology or chemistry, excuse me, uh, well, you know. we do have sonic hedgehog and wind signaling. Now, those are very descriptive. <laughs> okay, you win. Yeah, I think I, I win that no matter what. And, and it's, it's my field whose vocabulary is drawn upon to name commercial products. It's Quasar brand television, we've got Pulsar watches, We've got, uh, look at car names. The Galaxy 500, we got the, no the Chevy Nova. Although Nova is a star that is just blown up, so I don't think Chevy knew that when they named their Chevy Nova, but that's between you and me. Uh, but there is no car named the deoxyribonucleic acid. No, nope. we'll work on that. <laughs> right. There's no black hole yet, either. That, that's yeah, because that'd be hard to, it'd be hard to the, sell. It'd be hard no, to sell no, that. No. But uh, Big Bang, that's, we're into one syllable word, Big Bang. The beginning of all time, space, and everything, Big Bang. Most important event in the universe. Most important molecule in the human body has nine syllables. <laughs> Did I get it right? Yeah, I think so. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Yeah, nine. Now that's why I work on ribonucleic acid. <laughs> Mike Cut, that. Name. Um, Cut it right through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, many of us were saddened by Pluto's being demoted from planet to, I'm sorry, it, it, just, it, just was, it just was really a tough day to open the newspaper and see that. What, what do you professionals think about this? We're Get so over it. <laughs> Actually, I had something to do with it. Oh. Uh, I, at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, we have the Hayden Planetarium, the Rose Center for Earth and Space. That I'm in charge of that, the universe part of the museum. And for our newly built $230 million facility, back in the year 2000, we opened with exhibit displays of the solar system where Pluto was removed from the seat. She's shaking her head up here. She's up there saying, <laughs> I was liking you up to now. I was like with you up till now. So Pluto was removed. And put where? Put with. You don't have it in your pocket, do you? No, I, no, I no. Pocket. Take a Pluto. It was with its brethren, newly discovered brethren of the outer solar system. Pluto, who here is like, likes Pluto? Who here was saddened that it got demoted? OK. Did you know? that there are six moons in the solar system bigger than Pluto, including Earth's moon? Did you know that? Did you know that Pluto is more than half ice by volume, such that if you brought Pluto to where Earth is right now, heat from the sun would evaporate that ice, and it would grow a tail? That's no kind of behavior for a planet, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That would look bad in the planet Pantheon, you know, if you were walking around with a tail. What, we, what was discovered in the early 1990s was that there were more objects in the outer solar system that had weird orbits, like Pluto, that were small, like Pluto, that were made of mostly ice, like Pluto. In fact, a new swath of real estate had been discovered, predicted to, be, to have been there about 50 years ago, now discovered, mm -hmm. named for uh, an astronomer called Gerard Kuiper, and it's called the Kuiper Belt of Comets. Pluto fits right in, fits right in. And so I think of it as not losing a planet, but as gaining a new member of the family of objects oh, in the okay. solar system. And we don't count the planets. That's the big, that's the big pedagogical gaffe to believe that the enumeration of planets somehow constitutes science. But it's not. People say, well, there's nine. Now I have to remember a different number. That's not science. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care how many planets there are. That's not interesting. Tell me what planets have in common with each other, what, what, how they differ. In our exhibits, we don't have 
the, 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 the Saturn panel and then the, the Jupiter panel, we have all the data on each. That implies that this enumeration is something important. That's not what we do. We have a panel that says rings. And we talk about ring phenomena among objects in the solar system. Another one, we talk about ice. We talk about where ice is in the solar system. Your comets, are, some moons are, have a lot of ice. Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, is covered in ice. You get to talk about them in the same breath because they have things in common. You talk about storms, there now you get to talk about Jupiter, Earth, and Mars in the same breath. We've got atmospheres, we've got uneven heating of, our Earth's, of the surfaces, you've got storms. So that's how science progresses. Not memorizing. You have teachers giving exams. What is the name of the fifth planet from the sun? That's not science. So I, in, I believe we took the pedagogical and scientific high road. And in fact, the greater scientific community ultimately agreed with that six years later and voted for demotion. Oh, by the way, after we did that to Pluto, it took a year before the public noticed. And it was a New York Times reporter a year later who overheard a kid say to his mother, Mommy, where's Pluto? It's got to be there somewhere. You know, look, keep looking. I'm busy. Yeah. Mommy, where's Pluto? It, just keep looking. And it was, wasn't there. And he thought he had like a story of the century. And so on page one <laughs> of the New York Times, on January 21st, 2001, now what should have really filled that day's headlines? Think about it. January 21st, 2001. Actually, sorry, it's January 22nd. What should be like big headlines that day? Inauguration of the president. They're still counting dimple chads in Florida. A president gets inaugurated. There's news about Washington then. That was the newspaper on page one of the New York Times that had the title this wide. Pluto not a planet? Only in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Then came the hate mail from third graders. <laughs> I was public enemy. And so, I, just so I have just written a book, I, it's now in like copy edited, I have it with me in fact, if you want to take a look at some of the pages. It'll come out January 09. It's called The Pluto Files. And it has, and I've reproduced scans of letters from children pissed off that <laughs> I, <laughs> Uh, there's one girl in fifth grade. She says, dear Dr. Tyson, wh why, why did you demote Pluto? Uh, why is it not a planet anymore? Uh, if, how did, if someone lived on Pluto, that means they wouldn't exist. <laughs> it's like, OK, and it goes on. And, and it says, uh, I think that's discrimination. Discriminating a planet because it's, um, because of it's small. Far away. OK, and then it said at the end, please write back soon. But don't write in cursive, I can't read it yet. <laughs> so I have letters from children. I have arguments from adults. I have colleagues duking it out between people who really don't care and just think about it and others who are invested in missions to Pluto on the premise that if it's a planet, it has a planet's worth of budget to spend on it as opposed to just a dirty ice ball in the outer solar system. <laughs> So there was politics, culture, and you can't neglect, you can't omit, you can't sweep under the rug the greatest force of them all, and it's the force of Disney. Disney is the true plutocracy there, because you have the dog, <laughs> made in America, first conceived and drawn the same year that Pluto, the cosmic object, was discovered. Oh. So the same tenure in the American consciousness. That's why Europeans didn't care one way or another. <laughs> they said, Pluto, isn't that the little one out there that doesn't know how to orbit the sun? Keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we have people, you know, so, so overall, you just get over think, it. Get overall, over. though, it does sound like this story has a silver lining because it encouraged people to become interested in what is a planet? How does one define that? It, it would also had the um, elements of the press poking fun at the astronomical community. For example, they said, <laughs> in one case, um, this is when, at the time, and is still the case, the New York Knicks, the basketball team, is doing abysmally in, in, in the NBA. And so a sports writer had a headline and said, uh, astronomers meet in Europe uh, 
to discuss whether they should demote the New York Knicks to a dwarf basketball team. <laughs> they dribble the ball and they look and dress like a basketball team, but they're lacking in certain fundamental aspects, like scoring. Right? <laughs> so, so, they go, so it goes on and on and on. And so they and, and people had fun with it. And so the Pluto Files it has, is a retelling of that trajectory of information told firsthand, because I was in the middle of the hate mail. You know, I was like x-raying packages from elementary school for like six months. I guess you just have to increase public interest in science by whatever it takes. Well, right? I, was, I, I lost probably a year of my life fielding <laughs> questions and, and the like. So, so this book better pay off, because I'm telling you, that was like, yeah. So let's go, since, since uh, the audience here is particularly interested in career pathways, scientific So I noticed careers. this morning, there was a lot of angst in the room, I could tell, in the air well, this morning. Well, I think, you know, a healthy respect for, for the fact that this is not the, e it, it could be an exciting life, but, but not the easiest life. Mm -hmm. And how did your, let's start when you were young. When did you first know you were going to be a scientist? I was nine years old. And, and what science were you intrigued by at age nine? The universe. Oh, so you were really, and did you deviate from this astronomical pathway through your career and then come back to it, or was it always just, first you were an astronomer and then an astrophysicist, and that was Well, I, I, I learned how to pronounce astrophysics, and that was it, uh, thenceforth. Uh, I was, your trajectory, once you know that interest runs deep, then, by the way, this is the advantage of knowing what you want to do early, because then you can align the forces of your life to enable opportunities that might otherwise have gone by unnoticed. You were nine years old. I was nine, and I, I visited, my parents took me to the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, oh. and I looked up. Because you couldn't see the stars that's in New York City well, because of all the light pollution. Yeah, I mean, that's a true statement, but let me say it a slightly different way. I didn't even know there were stars to look at oh. to not see, <laughs> right? If you don't know that they're there, you don't know that you're missing them. So it's not that, gee, I wish I could see the stars, let's go to the planetarium. It's, okay, that's just, you know. <laughs> it's just dark, or kind of lightish dark, all right? So I'm in there, they dim the lights, the stars come out, and I was just struck by it. Imprinted, I guess, is the biological word, and behavioral biology. Did I get that right, imprinting? I think that's the right term. And I, I was starstruck. Somebody rung a bell and you salivated. But, <laughs> right. but, but, but not literally. Yeah, just, yeah I was, I, it was coursing through my veins. And well, actually, initially, I just thought it was a hoax. Because I knew how many stars there were in the night sky. There was like 12 or something. And now there were thousands. So it was a fun hoax. I didn't, you know. And then I, my parents, we, we went on a trip to Pennsylvania and to the Caribbean. We have some lineages through the Caribbean. And I saw for the first time the night sky as it was like intended to be seen. And to this day, to this day, and I have access to the finest telescopes on the highest mountaintops, I look up and see the night sky. To this day, I say to myself, it reminds me of the Hayden Planetarium, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of sick when you think about it, <laughs> that the real world would remind me of a projected dome on a sky. <laughs> but that's what the imprinting does. And I was hooked ever since. And I went to the Bronx High School of Science uh, I majored in physics in college. That's where the foundational language is for understanding the universe. And you apply those laws of physics to understanding cosmic phenomena. Uh, not only gravitational problems uh, involving planets, moons, satellites, uh, but also the birth, lives, and deaths of stars. Uh, they have, some have spectacular deaths. Uh, what galaxies do, what the ensemble of galaxies do in our neighborhood, what the entire universe is doing. And so anything off Earth's surface is fair game for the astrophysicist. Now, Neil, you make it sound like at age nine, you had this vision of yourself as an astrophysicist, and you sort of marched very steadily towards that goal. But there must have been some time. Tell me about the time, the, the toughest time you had on this pathway when you almost did, went and did something else? And, and, and what, what kept you on track? Well I, I, well, I still can't say that I almost did something else. 
You know, astrophysics is not the first subject you think of to put food on somebody's plate or to somehow improve the situation of the underprivileged in the world. It's just not the first profession that you think of. Um, so my parents, who were, my father was active in the civil rights movement. Uh, my mother was a housewife at the time, a very uh, common profession of the day. And later on, went back to school, became a gerontologist. So here are my, my parents who are helping people. And here's their son, you know, studying black holes, right? Look it up at the sky. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a little weird. It's a little weird, but they were supportive of this. And all right. But I still had some discomfort about whether I was doing the right thing culturally. Mm -hmm. I knew I was doing the right thing personally, but you want to make a difference in the world. If, if, if you don't want to make a difference in the world, go move to another planet. I mean, why, what are you here for? You know, why? Just don't move to Pluto. <laughs> that's right. That's, that wouldn't count. But. And so, meanwhile, all right, I, I go to high school and I take extra science classes and extra math classes and you know, advanced calculus and all this stuff. And I go to college. And I was athletic in high school and college. I wrestled, by the way. Uh, I, I wrestled in the weight category at the time, uh, 190 pounds, 190. Now, that's a key weight category of all of them. There are 10 weight categories. Why? Because if you show up 192 pounds, you then get classified in a weight category called unlimited, okay? <laughs> so there's really good incentive to hit that weight. <laughs> so there's another guy on the team who was my weight. We were the same weight. He was a senior, talented fellow, majoring in economics. In fact, he became a Rhodes Scholar during the year. And we'd, go, we'd come in, I had a nice good workout, we're coming out, and he said, you know, how's, how's it going? I'm a freshman, I just, how's it going? I said, oh, all my problem sets are kicking my butt, I barely have time to go to the bathroom. And he said, well, what was it you're majoring in again? I said, oh, physics. And he says, well, and you wanna do what with it? I said, I wanna uh, get a PhD in astrophysics. And you know what he said to me? By the way, what was he going to do with his Rhodes Fellowship at Oxford? He was going to explore the role of enterprise zones in inner city neighborhoods to empower those who are economically disenfranchised. Okay. He's black, by the way. So he turns to me and said, astrophysics. The, then he says the following, the black community cannot afford the luxury of someone with your intellect to spend it on that subject. And I was devastated by that comment. Devastated. Now, he wasn't just anybody saying it. This is somebody who was walking the walk and talking the talk. And so I had no way out of that. He dug a hole and put me in the hole. And I, and, and I had no shovel, I mean, no ladder, no way, to, and there I was in a hole, trying to think my way out of it. And I knew my interest in the universe was real because I felt it in my heart. I felt it coursing through my veins. But my responsibility as an educated member of society was eating away at that ambition. In the absence of another way to think about the problem, I just kept at it, but with this albatross around my neck, this, this guilt that maybe I wasn't doing all I could to help others. All right. It's 1989. I'm in graduate school in New York City, Columbia University, Upper West Side. A phone call comes into the department from Fox News. This is before Fox was a national network. It was just local Fox News. The weather guy had read over the newswire that there was an explosion on the sun. Okay. A blob of plasma, plasma, astrophysical plasma, which is just a gas with a lot of ionized particles in it. So it actually responds to magnetic fields. It's kind of a, kind of a cool state, of, sometimes called the fourth state of matter. And the guy said, you know, I get this is explosion on the sun. What could you tell us about it? I said, oh, 
It's just a blob of plasma, highly a ch a charged particles moving fast. About 100 times the size of the Earth. <laughs> yeah, it's large. It's a big plasma pie headed towards Earth. As it gets closer, these charged particles will notice the magnetic field of the Earth. They will split positive and negative. They will be attracted to the poles. They will spiral down, collide with the molecules in Earth's atmosphere, excite them, and render them aglow, creating the northern lights or the aurora borealis. So tomorrow and over the weekend, why don't you go north and have a good look at it? He says, you mean Earth is OK? I said, Earth is fine. <laughs> they said, can you say that on the air? And I said, uh, OK. And they said, well, send up a limo. And I said, limo, on the air? And I'm like, I'm a graduate student, all right? I'm wearing my one shirt, and I got B.O., and I'm not, you know. So I said, could you send the limo to my house, OK, to my apartment? And meet me there, not at the office. So I like run home, shower, put on my one tie, my one, you know, shirt, my one jacket, go to the interview, would sit in here like this, a little backdrop of books, kind of the, this, the erudite set. Anyway, so we do the interview, and that's why we record the tape at 3 in the afternoon. So I go home, call everybody, mom, dad, sis, brother, grandma, grandpa. So I'm going to be on TV. Tune in. This is my first time on TV. So I'm home eating dinner, OK? And the interview comes on. There it is. So there it is. And at the end, I had an epiphany. Revelation. You ready? Yeah. It's 1989. I had never before in my life, and I believe to this day that that was the first such occasion ever, but I had never before in my life seen an interview mm. with a black person on television for expertise that had nothing to do with being black. Uh, holding aside, of course, interviews with performers and musicians or, or athletes, right? I'm talking about experts. An Bro intellectual. Intellectual. Subject. I had never seen a black person. Here. The guy didn't ask me, well, how do black people feel about this plasma <laughs> coming from the sun? <laughs> what does your community feel about this? Will it harm your skin the way it will harm ours? That's not the conversation that unfolded. I was telling him whether Earth would survive. <laughs> and at that point, I realized that one of the last stereotypes that prevailed in the, among people who carry stereotypes is that so that black people are somehow dumb. There used to be the stereotype that blacks were like physically unable, right? You know, shiftless and lazy. And then Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics sets four world records within 45 minutes in front of Hitler, right? The Aryan race. So that kind of fixed that one, right? We got that one done. You know, no one is saying blacks don't have physical ability. That one's done, OK? So when you combine this, I wondered, maybe, if there's more of this, that's a way to undermine the sort of the, the stereotype that prevailed about who's smart and who's dumb. And think about it. The word smart is not applied to all professions, even if you are smart in that profession. No one talks about smart lawyers. They may say a brilliant lawyer. They'll talk about a creative artist. Smart is saved for scientists. It just is. It's not even really applied to medical doctors. It's a, it applies to scientists in the lab figuring stuff out that hadn't been figured out before. So if you had visible examples of this, then whatever is your next encounter with the black person trying to squeegee your windshield at the, at the red light, and if you're prone to saying, oh, these black people, they don't work and they're too dumb, you're going to have to remember that I just told you that Earth is safe from the plasma that came from the sun. And so you're going to have to reconcile this. You're going to have to be wondering, well, maybe this guy could have been one of those but for lack of opportunity, but for lack of institutions with foresight, OK? And Neil, at this point, you had the answer to your Rhodes Scholar. Thank you. I said to myself, 
I just have to be visible, or others like me, in that situation. That would have a greater force on society than anything else I could imagine. Anything else. And so to this day, I'm getting email from white people saying they wish they were as smart as I was. That was an unthinkable thing 30 years ago. That just would not have ever happened. White people wishing they were smart like black people. And so, um, I, so, so then I said to myself, it's not that the black community can't afford to have me do astrophysics. It can't afford to me to not do astrophysics. And at that point, I found myself standing outside the hole. I had climbed out just the act of observing that interview. And since then, there have been other interviews with uh, 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 intellectuals of minority groups that have nothing to do with their being a minority. But I think that might have been the first ever. And I'll tell you why I think it was the first. Not that I've seen every single broadcast up until that minute of every channel, but it was another five years before I saw it happen again. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it was a and you were blip. Looking for and, I, and then yeah. you're looking. Yeah. It's like you buy a new car and everybody yeah, somehow right. has your car that you're right, driving. Right. You're, you're, but how did that happen? Well, you're now looking for it. So I was looking for it. And it went another five years. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm out of the hole. So then I said, well, let me look up my guy, see what he's doing. I can't find him anywhere on the internet. I don't know where he is. So I, th I think I made the right decision. And that's, what, that's how that unfolded. But that, and I, Yes, I still knew I wanted to become an astrophysicist, but there was the comfort level for having made that decision that I had to work myself into. Very good, wonderful story. Yeah. More, maybe equally apropos to these young budding scientists' thoughts about their career, what do you do, or what did you do, what should they do if you start out in a program after having chosen it very carefully and being very excited about it, and then things don't work out. At what point do you just try harder, and at what point do you, do you cash it in and go somewhere else? I started graduate school, not at Columbia University, where this story unfolded. I started at the University of Texas. As a graduate student at that institution, I had a fellowship to attend. Graduate students had access to large telescopes in ways that attending other universities you would not. So you get good telescope access. It had some good theorists there. And uh, so I had high expectations for that program. And rather than rehashing other complexities about my life as a graduate student, which was unorthodox, I, I was a really different kind of student. My portfolio of activities included a lot of things that was not a graduate student. And I did that in high school and college. One of, I wrestled, for example, I also rode crew. And I did, did stuff. I even da I danced, OK? And I danced uh, ballet and modern and um, international Latin ballroom, competitive Latin ballroom. And so I might be able to still do that. Let me see if I can still do it. Let me see. Uh, you're, 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 not, you're not going to appear. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'll still do that. OK. So. I, I'm just going to interrupt you yeah. long enough to say that I just thought of a new meaning for, for dancing with the star. Star, there you go. There you go. So I had all these activities that I pursued. What I didn't know was that I was expected to drop them all and only give 100% of my life to the lab. Again, it's the figurative lab. And I was uncomfortable doing that. I was worried that all of a sudden I would no longer be all that I was. I'd have to be something else. And it was quite distressing for me. The rest of what I was was my identity. To say, cut all that out, never leave the lab. I didn't, if that's what I needed to be an astrophysicist, which was coursing through my veins since age nine, I said, all right, I guess I'm going to have to just change my personality. As uncomfortable a decision as that was. And so I changed my personality, made it less gregarious, less socialized, less, and I just kind of became this hermit. And I found out that the opinions of those in judgment of me, because graduate school is all about the judgment the faculty has on your promise and performance as a future scientist. It's all about that. It's not about anything but that. They're all trying to make a judgment about what you will be and what kind of scientist you will be. 
And so what I then learned is that they had already assessed my likelihood of success based on the two years that I had to sort of shed myself. In other words, they were imprinted with who they thought I already was. So uh, when I had problems with my advisor and committee, I said, it's time for me to transfer <laughs> my program. So, oh, by the way, there's a, there was a point where they dissolved my committee. And, the, and then I appealed it. And they said, OK. So my committee is basically kicking you out of graduate school. I appealed it. And they said, OK, you can come back, but you have to start an entire new PhD thesis with a whole different advisor, because the advisor relationship wasn't working, as well as all the rest of this. And then they said things like, no, think carefully before you do this. This would be another five years of toil. And, and then I realized, I realized, this, <laughs> they're trying to taunt me on the premise that the toil you invest in getting a PhD is somehow something to avoid, somehow that that's bad. When in fact, that is the scientific enterprise. Your PhD is just your first big research project that we expect many more of of you down the line. Yet they said this to me as though I was going to say, oh, more work, more research, I better not. Let me find something else to do. <laughs> and some of, the advice, some of the other advisors, thinking they're doing me a favor, said, you know, you have this personality, why don't you become a computer salesman? I know some people who work for computers, you could become, then they're trying to do me a favor by getting me out of their community. And I didn't mean to push on you like that, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I said to myself, if I'm going to have to do a whole new PhD, it's not going to be at this institution. If it's got to be fresh, I might as well be fresh in another place. And that's when I knocked on doors. Uh, there were faculty that had seen me deliver papers, uh, oral papers and poster papers at our society conferences, the American Astronomical Society. And I said very, something very simple. He was the chairman of the department at Columbia. I said, circumstances are such that I need to transfer my graduate program. Will you consider taking me as a student? That sentence is sufficiently understood by anyone in a graduate school environment that he didn't say to me, well, what happened with your advice? Tell me. Give me the details. Why did it? It's like it wasn't working out. And the fact that I was still on my feet and still knocking on doors, that told him something right away. But not only that, he had seen me. He had had scientific conversations with me. So it helped that I was visible at conferences. It, it helped that I was speaking to other scientists about their work, about my work. You had a network. Yes, outside of the one that was tarnished. And so he said, the least we, we can, should make you do is take the general exam, which is just the, uh, the textbook learned subject, so that they can say he's with everybody else yeah. in the school. And then I transferred in for, directly for the PhD. Um, skipping the masters. And, um, and it was just a completely different environment, as well as different. a fresh start. And I got right? to, it's basically the fresh start. And so, you know what it was? It was lost income because it was, the time was delayed before I would get the PhD and get PhD level income. But it was not lost professional development because I had an expertise germinated in the previous PhD that I had been writing, and I actually had published uh, two papers based on that thesis. But now I had a whole other thesis in a whole other subject area. So as a result, as they say, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I had a greater breadth in my depth of understanding of astrophysics as a freshly minted PhD student. And immediately after graduation, I was offered a postdoc at Princeton University, and that's, which has a, a leading astrophysics department. So I can tell you that in the end, what matters more than anything, it matters even more than how smart you are, is how strong is and how deep is your ambition. Because no one ever said graduate school is going to be easy. No one even said that there's this trajectory you follow, and if you just do that, everything will be fine. Because graduate school, you have to have relationships with people who stand between you and the success of your career. It's got to work. It's got to be fertile. It's got to, they've got to respect your intellect. That it, and it's going to be hard work, yes. 
That's why you're doing it. You're not doing it because it's easy. You're doing it because it's hard. If you did it because it was easy, everybody would have done it. And then you'd have no distinction about what it is you were pursuing for yourself in this enterprise, this great enterprise we call research science. So while they were telling me to be the computer salesman, while I had, was being kicked out of graduate school, there was a point where I was in my parents' basement without an academic affiliation, something that I had had and maybe even taken for granted my whole life, without a job. You know, how, low can, can it, how much lower can you get? You're kicked out of school. You don't know if you're going to get into another school. Your life's ambition. This is not just something that I discovered in college because astrophysics was early in the alphabet in the course catalog. <laughs> you know, it was something that was deep within me. And I needed those reserves. I needed the support from my family. That was a subject that came up this morning. Support from loved ones. It's all part of the reserve of energy. And these are the challenges. By the way, some people have it easier than others. You might luck out with a good advisor. But don't assume that just because you have overlapping research interests that the, the interpersonal relationship will work. So I want to hear what you guys, if you have questions. Oh, no, you, did you have more questions here? I don't no, know. I'm, I'm, you got, you got I'm, the whole thing here. Man. <laughs> Look at what, we didn't get through half of this. <laughs> but I think you're right. I think it would be more interesting. Not that I don't love you here with the to, questions, but. To, uh, to, to hear what some of the students in the audience might, might want to. And if not, then we can go back to your questions. That's fine. Yeah. Um, hi, Dr. Tan, uh, Tyson. My name is Puya Jamshidi. Uh, I'm a cognitive science student at UCSD. Um, being a cognitive science student, I'm... Cognitive, that means thought? Thoughts, right. Okay, why so, don't they say thought scientist? <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder. So I'm, I'm interested in answer, thought trends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like um, early on you've been really interested in big things like uh, universe, TV interviews, and billions, as you mentioned. Um, so where, was it a small thing that you were interested in? I'm not gonna uh, take the Pluto against you, you know. I know it was small and you didn't like it, but what are you thinking about uh, um, small stuff as well? By the way, you know what I wanted to tell the press? I wanted to say, we kicked Pluto out of the solar system, it's too small to make it in New York. You know, I wanted to be like a really, like, uh. I wanted to be, you know, really piss them off, but uh. I was more professional than that. Well, what, when you were thinking about your, uh, your future profession, were you thinking about small stuff as RNA, for example? Uh, like, were you intrigued by small stuff as well, or were you thinking big? I, I, I valued science literacy in all the, all the sciences. So uh, while I was less comfortable with biology, I was always frustrated that there was so much to have to remember. Whereas in physics, you don't have to remember anything. There's just a few equations, and you derive the understanding of the universe from that. So just compare the thickness of biology books to the thickness of, you know, all of Einstein's relativity fits in, you know, 20, 30 pages, you know. So it's, there's a difference in the, how the brain is wired by the time you're done in the exercise. And so I was more frustrated by biology um, than by chemistry, chemistry being a little closer. Uh, we have quantum mechanics in common that, between us. Um, so no, I'm not interested professionally, but I was certainly interested because it was the scientific investigation of, of the natural world. Um, I got an A-plus on my biology uh, term paper. I took biology as a senior, which is rare, I think, a senior in high school, uh, because I took physics as a sophomore, followed by chemistry, and then biology, usually that's in reverse. So I was there with a lot of freshmen and sophomores, it's kind of interesting. But um, an A-plus on my final paper, because I experimented with how to grow a plant completely upside down. Um, I had like soil and water supply up here and light supply down here. And I wanted to see what the contest was between going towards the light, going towards the light but against gravity. Yeah, right? Geotropism versus phototropism. There you go. Oh, is that what that's called? <laughs> <laughs> you knew that. Thank you for complexifying the. <laughs> Yeah, we biologists are good at that, <laughs> as I think you've pointed out six or seven times during right. this interview. Okay. Up there. Uh, my name is Imran, and I'm currently a Gilliam Fellow at Yale. And my question is, um, did you ever come to a point where you began taking up some of those hobbies that you started giving up? And um, so I guess maybe two questions. That, that, that's the first one. And um, the second question is, 
Um, did you ever encounter difficulties in terms of your actual thesis work, like when you're when you're at Columbia, those difficult times in your thesis? Because um, for me, my person, I find like different hobbies that I am involved in sort of we get through the. Okay, uh, excellent question. Uh, I'll repeat it in case the recording devices needed him to have been actually live on the microphone. The first question was, uh, I forgot it. What was the first question? <laughs> Giving up hobbies, oh, yeah, or do yeah, they help yeah. sustain you through them? Were, were any of my lost hobbies resurrected in my later years? Uh, I paraphrase, but I think that's your question. The second question was, uh, what did I do? Did my thesis just go swimmingly, or were once the, you got to Columbia? Yeah, once I, yeah. Were, or were there occasions where I reached an impasse, perhaps not knowing what to do? So, uh, first question. Um, I picked up some of the hobbies. As I got older, it's harder to like wrestle. You know, um, you just learn that you don't recover as fast. Uh, <laughs> Like, normally I'd bounce back by the next afternoon, and now I was out for three days, I noticed. Um, I took on other hobbies that were more befitting my aging body, but my growing intellect. And so I took on the effort of reading old accounts of scientific discovery. So I have a growing collection of antiquarian science books. I read the original writings of Galileo and Newton and Copernicus, and through books that were in circulation at the time they were alive. And you can see like wax marks on it because as people read at night with wax candles. I mean it was, and so that brings a certain element of romance to the study of how we came to understand our place in the universe. And it also can be humbling to see the confidence our scientific predecessors may have had in one idea or another and watch it evaporate in the face of new information. I expect my research today, I carry that sensitivity to what might be right or wrong, gleaned from that exercise. I also can tap it when I get interviewed on television. I have a whole histor history of science reservoir of uh, reference to flesh out and put in context a discovery that might be going on today. So what I've accepted about my life is, yes, I reintroduced things that were not center line to that interest. But I have seeded those other activities as being chapters of my life. And now I'm writing different chapters, figuratively and literally. Because when I was wrestling, rowing, and dancing, I was not writing books. Now I'm writing books. The Pluto book is my ninth book. And so uh, you, you just say what, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that is kind of They're cool. quick. Yeah, OK. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's how that uh, plays out. I still do them. They just take on a different timbre. And I value them greatly. Uh, about impasses, they're not impasses. That's just science. Don't look at it as a problem. Look at it as science. You know, there's the delusion, the, the delusion that science is about discovery. It was never about this discovery. That's what gets reported on in the press. But the press doesn't report about all the days in the lab where discoveries aren't happening. They don't report about all the blind alleys that you don't know are blind until you get to the end of the alley. That's the process of science. That's the trajectory that we're all buying into here, emotionally, physically, culturally. If you don't like the dead end, find something else to do. Because most of what you do will be dead ends. And your ability to intellectually navigate to the side of them, beneath them, over them, around them, into another direction, is the measure of how good a scientist you are. In fact, if you happen to luck out and have projects that worked out for 10 different papers in a row, you're not being trained as a scientist. Because the day a problem happens, I don't know what you're going to do about it. Whereas everybody else, who had to gut slog through and had to redo a problem because they made a wrong assumption, or the lab specimen got contaminated, or and they didn't know it until later. And they read the lab book, and they find out that the cleaning person came in and, 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 and pet the mice in the lab. <laughs> you know, yeah, And you find out later, and you lose a year of your life. You actually didn't lose a year. It's just more of the process of science. 
You're buying into the process. You're buying into the journey. You're not buying into the product. And not enough of the public understands this. The public thinks we just discover stuff. In fact, your dead end, you publish that dead end. If, if you design the experiment correctly, that's gonna be an interesting dead end that he doesn't have to take the next time he looks into that same problem. And he's gonna reference your paper. <laughs> Okay, not, oh, look, he messed up, ha, ha, ha. No, he's gonna say, these paths did not work for these reasons, forcing me to make a different assumption. Yeah. That's the enterprise of science. And if it delays your PhD, you got your whole friggin' life. You just, you, you'll delay a year of income. I don't, it's, it's, don't worry about that. What are you gonna, what's your hurry? You're gonna be doing this your whole life. Celebrate it. I don't mean to like get all on your case. <laughs> it looks like, like I'm facing him now. You know, it's like, it's all your fault that you're the one. <laughs> so you'll be measured not by not having dead ends, but how well you navigate around them at the time you notice that they're there. We have one last question down here in the green sweater. Last question? Well, I don't know. I think we're. Okay. Unless not someone is like busting okay. at the seams. Okay. Right. Not, okay. Maybe okay. not the last question. Okay. We have an additional question. Additional. Okay. Um, I'm Kathy and I'm a physical chemistry major. Mm -hmm. So I have, you mentioned dark matter. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering what you think about the existence of dark matter in terms of explaining the phenomena that sort of happening um, in the universe because there seems to be conflicting views whether or not um, you actually need to account for dark matter in Einstein's um, sort of uh, Einstein's modified theory of gravity. So I don't know what you think about that, but just out of curiosity. Okay, uh, dark matter is a profound area of ignorance that we live with in astrophysics. One of two largest areas of ignorance. There is such a thing as we call dark energy, which is a mysterious pressure on the cosmos operating opposite that of gravity having the universe accelerate in its expansion. It should be slowing down because gr the collective gravity of all the galaxies is, uh, is an attractive force. But there is this pressure of the vacuum. We call it dark energy. We have no idea what it is. That's just a, a placeholder term for it. We could have called it Fred, all right? It's just what it is. There's this thing called dark matter, which is actually misnamed. It's really dark gravity. We don't know if it's matter. There is gravity out there that has no known source. You account for all the electrons, protons, neutrons, black holes, gas clouds, uh, dark clouds, planets, stars. You account for all it up, add it all up, it does not account for the total gravity observed in the universe. Not even close. Is it is one sixth of the total gravity observed. That's not close. Not only that. <laughs> Not only that, three quarters of the universe is this dark energy stuff. So one quarter is ordinary matter and dark matter. Of that one quarter of the universe, it's the five-sixths of it, we don't know what that is. So how, what does that leave? That leaves like 4% of the universe that we actually have a predictive understanding of what it is. Okay. And we're candid about that. All right. We, we don't claim ma that we're masters of the cosmos with our feet up on the desk. We are candid about it. And I have to tell you a quick biology story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remind, and you're avoid, a chemist. So you're avoid okay. abbreviations okay. Okay. that don't make sense. Okay. All right. So uh, it has been suggested that maybe we don't actually understand Newton's gravity or Einstein's gravity correctly. Maybe there's some new equation for gravity that when you apply the new equation, that all the dark matter uncertainties go, they just evaporate. That it's just, we're just stupid. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people, top people working on that problem. They are having only limited success. But they're sort of wedded to their theory. You don't want to ever be wedded to your theory. Because what happens is you remember that in the, at the end of the day, even though you're a scientist, you are still a human being. And human beings have intellectual frailties, such as you believe your idea about how something works more than anybody else. And that's good to a point, 
but it's possible to then start living your idea. And you lose the ability to assess or to recognize evidence that conflicts with it to the point where you should just discard it. There are many examples of this all throughout the history of science. Um, I was on Charlie Rose, you know, the, 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 the PBS talk show once. This is back in 96 when there was evidence that we might have discovered life on a Martian meteorite. Okay? Mars, there are meteorites on Earth that started on Mars. Okay? And the way that happens is you have asteroid impacts that hit with such ferocity that they cast surrounding rocks into space, reaching escape velocity, and then they float in space and then land on Earth. It's estimated that there's several tons of Martian rock on Earth. We just have to find it. Now, the evidence was all circumstantial. All right? There was evidence of... It was morphological. Basically, it was... No, 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 no. Slicing these and looking at them in the microscope. No, no, no. There was they were round. Morphological, he means... Shape. Shape, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there were some shapey things that, that contributed, but that, that was not the lead evidence. The lead evidence was that in this one rock, oh, by the way, we know that Mars was once wet, fertile, you know, we have dried riverbeds and floodplains and, and rivers, uh, 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 lake beds where the lake surface is salty, and you only get that if you had concentrated salt that then evaporated away. So in other words, there are minerals, rock minerals that could only have come about by the evaporation of water and that those having been in solution to it, okay? So this rock had, among the things in it, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, clearly a molecule's name not invented by astronomers. Um, so that's an organic molecule. It doesn't require organic process to make it, but it's common in organic environments. It also had, Reduced and, what's the opposite of reduced? Oxidized. Oxidized iron coexisting in the same nook of this rock. If you are reduced and oxidized, you are not in chemical equilibrium. You can't have that. That is not an equilibrium state. One of the most famous non-equilibrium states there is is called life. Okay, inside your body, you have freshly oxygenated hemoglobin coming out of your lungs, reduced hemoglobin going into your lungs, occupying the same volume of organic matter. Okay? So, not only that, we then have the shape of a little wormy looking thing that is like one-tenth the size of the smallest life forms known on Earth. And if you look at the electron microscope photograph, it looked like a little worm, it like little segments. It looked like a little cute little worm. Unanalyzed, just this, this image of it. That's what the press led with because it was, looked like a worm. But that was not the lead evidence presented. It was the combination of these organic materials all in the same place. All right. It's circumstantial evidence, granted. but. If you add up enough circumstantial evidence, you can make a pretty compelling case. Maybe the rock lived in an oxidizing environment and then rolled down a cliff and then landed in a reducing environment and it picked it up both right. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. And then they have to go someplace else to get the PAHs. Okay, but that seems like you're jumping backwards through a hoop when you can just simply say that life did it. Okay. Now, this was page one lead-off news. I'm on this, on this talk show. They pipe in a biologist. He comes in the screen. I didn't mean to say it that way. You know, <laughs> they pipe in a biologist. Well, of course you need a biologist because we're talking about life. So I'm there, and we're talking about it. And I said, I'm intrigued by this evidence. Life will do this for free. Yeah. And they showed the, the little wormy thing. And then the guy, the biology guy said, the biology, that, that can't possibly be life. And I'm thinking, why not? Is there something I'm missing that this, eh, this learned man on the screen is telling me? Because he was in like Minnesota or someplace else and he didn't come into, and is there something I'm missing? 
And I said, well, why can't it be, why can't that be, that little wormy thing be like? Because it's one-tenth the size of the smallest life on Earth. And I'm still ready for it to, like, I'm still thinking he's still going to give me an answer. Like, that's the lead into it. But that was his answer. And I said to him, last I checked, the rock is not from Earth. Okay? <laughs> so why is Earth your measure of what is possible in the whole freaking universe? All right? And so then I had to think about this. And I said, why is he, how come he can't open, he can't, open his he mind, can't yeah. do this? And I realized why. Because... Every, every week, we discover something in the universe that stumps us. We are humbled by our own discoveries. Whereas in biology, while you may celebrate the diversity of life on Earth, behind closed doors at the end of the day, you have to confess to each other that in fact you only have a sample of one because all life on Earth has DNA in common with each other. And as long as you have DNA in common, you could pretend it's different, but if you're going to compare it to something in another planet that might not be encoded by DNA at all, don't use your biological bias to judge what the rest of the universe is going to hand you. I'll never do that again. Okay. <laughs> Plus, now that you've reminded me Mars is a smaller planet than Earth, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yes, in the middle. Just, just speak up and you won't need the microphone. Hi, I'm Daisha. You spoke about an asteroid um, coming towards Earth. Well, she didn't forget that asteroid, did she? <laughs> she didn't forget the asteroid. So you want, you want a quick, quick, quick update on the asteroid. There's an asteroid. <laughs> the size of the Rose Bowl headed towards Earth. It's called Apophis, named for the Egyptian god of death and darkness. <laughs> now, it wasn't coincidental that it was named that. When this asteroid was discovered, in December 2004, its trajectory was calculated based on a short segment of its orbit. Because you look from one day to the next, it's in a new place in the sky. These, these, these folks are moving. Once you saw that its trajectory would intersect the orbit of Earth, you don't name that asteroid Bambi or, like, <laughs> or Tiffany, right? You're going to give it a name befitting it's Some sense of gravity. Yes. No pun intended. Yes. That pun was surely intended. Uh, so um, the reason why you never heard of it, perhaps, is because it was discovered that, that this aspect of its orbit was calculated and reported on the same week of the Indonesian tsunami. OK. I think it was uh, end of 04 or 05. I forgot which of these two years it is. Same week. Odd thing is, of course, that 200,000 people died in that tsunami. Odd thing is, if this asteroid hits in a place where it could hit, and I'll describe that in a minute, it will hit in the Pacific Ocean, it would create a tsunami in the Pacific Ocean that would make the Indonesian tsunami look like a street puddle that slightly overspilled its edges. So I think, rightly, the media attention was given onto the Indonesian tsunami. But that was not an excuse to then never have the press talk about this object. It's a real object. And um, there's something called the keyhole. Um, it'll have a close approach to Earth in the year 2029, in April, April 13th, which, by the way, is a Friday. Um, <laughs> it will come close enough to Earth to dip below our orbiting communication satellites. For that passage, that will be the closest, largest thing we have ever observed in the history of our observing the universe. That's a shot across our bow. The uncertainty in its orbit at this moment is such that for that passage, there is a range of orbits it could have, which if it goes through what we're calling the keyhole, Earth's 
gravity on it will be just right. Or rather, just wrong. Just wrong. <laughs> that the next time it ra around, it will hit Earth. Seven years later, April 13th. If it goes through the center of the keyhole, it'll hit the Pacific Ocean 500 kilometers due west of Santa Monica. It'll plunge into the Pacific Ocean to a depth of three miles. At that depth, it will explode, cavitating the ocean with a hole three miles wide, three miles deep. That impulse will send a, wave, a tsunami wave that will basically wipe out the entire west coast of the United States and the east coast of Asia. Now, oceans don't like having big holes in them. So this three mile high wall of water does what? It's a hole in the water. What is it doing? It falls back in the hole. This is not Moses here. We're talking. It won't just stay there, like in the movie. It'll fall back into the hole, slosh into itself, rise high into the air, fall back to the ocean, cavitate the ocean again. And it'll do this with such ferocity, it'll repeat itself about 50 times, taking about an hour. So every time it cavitates the ocean, it sends another tsunami. So it's not, it won't be just one wave, like the Indonesian tsunami was. This will be 40 waves, 50 waves. Now, each wave has to pull back out to get ready for the next one. And it's separated by about a minute. So there's a limit to how far these waves will get on shore. We think it's about a quarter of a mile. So if you're more than a quarter mile inland, you can just watch this happen. If you're not, <laughs> now, the million dollar Malibu homes, they will feel this first tsunami wave. And the tsunami will basically pick up the homes. It'll bring them back out to sea. Then the next wave will come and return the home to the, to the shoreline. But now the home is in a slightly different shape. <laughs> And as this continues, all man-made objects along the coastline and trees and debris basically becomes this churning, ablative mass, wiping clean the entire coastline. Now, nobody has to die, because we'll know this well in advance. But I found there are two, pe two people who will die. There is the stupid surfer <laughs> who says, I got to do that tsunami wave, dude. <laughs> You know they're going to be out there, OK? So we'll have dead surfers and dead weathermen. You've seen them. There's the camera guy over there. Come closer. Watch the hurricane smash into the, get this shot. Can you see this? I'm reporting from the hurricane. <laughs> Now, I'm a scientist. If this asteroid goes through the keyhole, there'll be people evacuating the West Coast, building shelters, stockpiling food. There'll be people praying to their gods. There'll be people doing all kinds of things. I'd rather be doing something about it. This is where engineers come in, and science, physical scientists, and physicists, and astrophysicists. So we've got top people right now working on a way to deflect the asteroid. Therein is the power of science. You don't have to build a shelter from something that could kill you. You can prevent the thing from killing you in the first place. <laughs> it's like, how do you solve acid rain? Well, let's have acid rain-proof umbrellas. You know, no, no. You want to like, stop the rain, all right? You know, how, how, how is your brain wired for finding solutions? <coughs> so there you have it. So we'll monitor the news at that time. By the way, there is, it is not known who will pay for that deflection mission if it comes to pass. Probably America, but asteroids can hit anywhere in the world. And the UN, while well, there's a space unit of the UN, that there's no funding stream. Suppose this were headed for Indonesia. Would we pay for, the, for that to deflect it? And suppose we pay to deflect it, and we only half deflect it, and then hit somewhere else. That's an interesting geopolitical problem. You know, so it's not just fix it and go home. It's, it's more complex than that. 
Oh, by the way, you got these guys who like stockpile nukes, and that community want to blow the sucker out of the sky. <laughs> you know, there's that, the folks who want to use the nukes that we have. And the problem is, here in America, we're really good at blowing stuff up. We're less good at knowing where the pieces go after the explosion. Whereas when you deflect something, you can monitor your progress all along. But another question? Question. Front row. Now, this is the last question. Show sure, last question. So, it's, it's, the pressure's on. Well, I think it's a good question because from talking to people here, I know a lot of students are really interested in not just their research, but also education, which is something you do. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how you were able to push yourself into a position to be such a big figure in education for the public in, uh, in terms of science in general, not just astrophysics. Excellent question. And that's an excellent question to end on, I think. Yeah. So, thanks. You came through. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's good. He's good. Um, all right. Uh, there are two things people like. They like it when they understand something that they previously thought they couldn't understand. It's a sense of empowerment. They also like, and they can either by spoken or by written word. So if you get better at writing with the intent of empowering a person's ability to think, then people will come back to you to write some more. If you have a phrase that captures the essence of an idea in language that is not too biological, <laughs> right? If you do not speak or write sesquipedaliously, That's with uh, seven feet. <laughs> uh, yeah, sesquipedalia. I think it's just really big words with a lot of syllables. <laughs> Look it up. Do you know about this? Word? I love that word because it is one. Of, it is a word that it's describing that it is. <laughs> Se a sesquipedalia word. Sesquipedalia is, is a, a sesquipedalia word. <laughs> Check it out. Don't ever write it though. So, you do this. Now, the first time I was ever interviewed for national television, it was, actually it was the first real time. I had a little bit on CNN, but I don't count that. It was like the six second bite. Uh, I was on NBC Evening News, nightly, NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw, 1995. The first planet in orbit around another star was discovered. Page one story. They sent an action cam to the planetarium. I was brand new as director of the planetarium. And I'm fundamentally an academic. That's how I think, it's how I behave. They bring in the cameras, they interview me, they ask me all these questions. How do we discover these planets? I gave my best professorial reply. I said, well, they actually use something called the Doppler effect. And you look at the spectral changes in the star responding in its gravity to the mass of the planet in orbit around it. We think to ourselves that a star is in the middle like the sun and planets orbit around it. No, the whole system orbits its common center of gravity, which means you got the likes of Jupiter and Saturn out there. The sun actually does this. And if you observe the sun, its spectral features, you will see the spectral feature oscillating in harmony with this motion. Either the sun has some kind of oscillatory problem, or you infer the existence of planets in orbit around it. We now have rising through 300 known planets in orbit around it, without ever actually seeing the planet. We're inferring their existence through their gravitational paw print on the star, host star itself. I gave my best professorial reply. Another one was, in the news reports from the discoverers, they used the word wobble to describe what the host star was doing. But I know what a wobble is. Tops wobble. That, you know, that's a wobble. This, this is not a wobble. It's more like a jiggle. And, and I describe, I show this. I said, it's not really a wobble. It's more like a jiggle. Like that. So, that night on the evening news, all they showed were my hips doing this. 
director of the planetarium says the star is actually jiggling. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I said, okay, you're gonna play that way? <laughs> you didn't like my professorial reply? You wanna sound bite me? I'm gonna hand you sound bites. I'm gonna be one step ahead of you because I'm living in their universe. I can't force their news program to listen to my lecture because that's their world. If they're gonna come to my classroom, they're gonna hear me lecture, but I'm gonna go to their newscast, I better talk the way they want it packaged. So I went home that weekend and I had my wife just sort of, sort of bark out concepts and phrases and things in the universe, black hole, quasars, Saturn, and every word she spoke I, I'm looking in a mirror and I came up with a two or three sentence sound bite on the object. Okay? So pick something in the universe, just to test, test this. Pick anything, I don't care. Uh, supernova. Supernova. The biggest explosions in the cosmos. <laughs> okay? They're using that sound bite. <laughs> the, they're using it. You know it. Okay? That's my one sentence sound bite. Two sentence sound bite? If one of these happens, Nearby Earth, it destroys our ozone layer and gives everyone in the world skin cancer. Boom! You know they're using that sound bite. <laughs> you know it. Okay? So I loaded up with sound bites. And every next time the camera came back and they asked a question, out came a sound bite. An uneditable sound bite. Because they try to piece it together. If you'd be all professorial, they got to cut it and make their own sentence. Uneditable sound bites. And when I started doing that, they started beating a path to my door. Other networks saw me on their program and they wanted me to do it for their program and now they're backed up, lined up, just because I'm giving them sound bites, just because I spent a little effort to speak their language. So I started valuing it and investing my own energy to become better at it. Whether or not you can ever become great at something, you can always become better at it. Don't ever forget that. And don't say, oh, I'll never be good. You can become better. And one day you'll wake up and you'll find out how good you actually became, having transcended whatever limits you might have thought you couldn't pass. And I've carried that sense of vision statement with me ever since I started writing, which was uh, early uh, high school. I think so that is there. great advice, not just with respect to this question, but with respect to these folks' whole careers. And Neil, you are something else we is that a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> when, a bi when a biochemist says you're something else <laughs> you it, you are you are simultaneously uh illuminating and entertaining and we thank you well thank you thank you very much. Thank you.